the trail. We're going to check the status of the beaked hazelnuts. It is the day before September. Summer is drawing toward its close, sadly. And the beaked hazelnuts are coming near fruition. They're very close to ripe. Yesterday I came across a beaked hazelnut tree and discovered that it was covered with beaked hazelnuts that are just about ready. The outer shells have become a bit painful to touch. They get these sharp little hairs. Not like stinging nettles. They don't have venom. They're more like tiny, tiny little thorns, like splinters almost like fiberglass to get up under the skin as they get close to ready. I didn't cut the shell open to see if the nut was quite ripe because I could tell by the shell that it was not quite ripe. However, this little, this little area is a couple miles from where I was foraging yesterday and uh, the nuts over here might be a week or two further along and a week or two further along would mean that they are ready for harvesting. As I go, I'm watching these copses for mushrooms very closely. And in fact, I think I see one now that I'm about to go and check out. This is a good time of the year to find late season mushrooms, such as uh, certain laxinums and uh, certain bolites and suilas, suilas in particular, like the end of summer when it starts to get cooler in these parts of Nova Scotia. And right over there, Let's see if I can zoom on it. Right over there between the trees, I see a large mushroom, but I'm not sure what kind it is. So I'm going to go and check it now. Well, the mushrooms I saw were this here. This is a form of Amanita. And uh, I don't need to know any more about it other than that it's an Amanita. If it's an Amanita, I don't harvest them. I know some mushroomers do, personally. After more than 40 years of foraging, I think that's a fool's errand. If you make a mistake with an Amanita, you only get to make it once. There is an experimental antidote to Amatoxin, but uh, that antidote is not a certain thing at this time, and I would prefer to avoid these. Messing with Amanitas is a touch-and-go thing. There are many kinds of Amanitas, some are deadly, many are toxic, some perhaps many are edible, but the difference between the edibles and the toxic ones is often a matter of great subtlety and determination. Even mycologists are often perplexed to determine one Amanita from another. Best to just leave that whole kettle of fish alone. There are plenty of other mushrooms that are just as tasty and a lot safer and easier to identify. We're just now coming into the old wood. You can see it right over there, catching the light of the westering sun. The trees are tall and dense in there, and we'll lose a good part of the light. But there still should be adequate light to accomplish our purposes of checking the beaked hazelnuts to see if they are ready, and filming the process so that you can get to see a little bit of what beaked hazelnuts look like. We are trekking into the shadows of the old wood. And there off to the west is the setting sun. We have maybe 45 minutes till it reaches the horizon, maybe, probably closer to 30. Here's an interesting rock. Notice the seat right there, the flat area. I like to take notes of things like this. As if, as if nature herself provided a chair. And often for my wife and I, my daughters and I, it's been a comfortable little spot to sit and rest at the end of a day of hiking or foraging. When I was through here a couple of weeks ago, I came across some nice bear tracks. And I am hoping to come across them again while out on this hike. The tracks were from a sow bear that I often keep tabs of. And she had a young one with her. 
wandering with her. And uh, I would just like to see those tracks and know that they're okay. Right down there is a small patch of beet hazelnut. They always grow in little cloned groups. That is a new patch to me. I was just passing by and happened to glance off to the right and notice it. When I was teaching a course last week, a young lady remarked, how on earth can you tell just by a glance what that is? I find their green to be relatively unique, both the green and the pattern that the beaked hazelnuts uh, present in the forest. They present almost like bonsai trees. Notice how even though they're comprised of many small slender trunks, they all come together as if they would like to form one huge trunk of an ancient tree. And the leaves spread out in a broad pattern as if they are the spreading branches of an ancient tree. And the green is just a shade darker yet purer than the shade of overhanging forest trees. So I'm going to go down there and check this tree and just see what condition the hazelnuts are in. Are they ripe and are they ready to be harvested? Well, there's one hazelnut right there. Here's one hazelnut from this small group of trees. This group has not produced many hazelnuts this year. Hopefully they didn't come in early right around here and the squirrels already got them, but if they did, I know some groups that are not quite mature yet. I'm going to open this up now and see if this hazelnut is about ready to be harvested. After you remove the husk, this is what the shell of a hazelnut looks like. Inside of there is a nut. There's still a lot of moisture in the husk, but the shell itself, upon removing it, quickly dried. It was easy to remove. So it's my belief that these nuts are about ready to be harvested. And this week I'm going to begin. Otherwise, if I don't move soon, the squirrels will beat me to them. As you can see right here, I've cracked open the hazelnut and it does indeed appear to be ready. That's the nut. And that's the shell that it came from. As you can see, the nuts are not really very large. It takes a lot of them to amount to much. The beak tailsel nut is not a nut that you would ordinarily rely upon for a major food source, though it is very rich in calories. The beaked hazelnut, rather, for us anyway, is a treat. We harvest several bags worth of them. We dry them out thoroughly, which causes those sharp, very tiny hairs, which are a lot like fiberglass splinters, to lose their ability to stab you. They sort of, they dry up or crinkle, I'm not quite sure what, but they just lose their ability to be painful and annoying. And then we can peel the nuts out of the shells. We then roast the nuts and set them aside and preserve them. Then when Daphne feels like making something special, she might crush up a measure of them and sprinkle them perhaps over a cake or she may make Turkish delight or some other wild food treat for us. It's a nice change of pace from the usual fare during the long winters when we're all getting a bit of cabin fever and are ready for something special to enliven the days. Here's another thicket of beaked hazelnuts. I didn't really have to walk far to find this patch of hazelnuts. You can see they have the distinctive growth pattern, slender trunks growing together. They must grow from clones out of closely packed roots to have this type of growth habit. I haven't read anything on that, but it does seem like the pattern of a plant which reproduces as much by cloning as by, by spreading its seeds. In any event, there's a hazelnut. And I can tell that, like the last one, it is right on the edge of being ripe. I would like to give it another week, but I have to watch these very carefully because the moment they are ripe, the squirrels will be in here like nobody's business. They'll remove these nuts 
and stow them away. Now there are a lot of beet hazelnuts back in this forest. If this was a primary food source for the squirrels or any other animal that really depended on them, I would leave them to the animals. But there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, that will continue to be back here for the animal's use. So I don't feel guilty about this. And just panning to the right here, you can get an extraordinary view of the sun setting beautifully through the canopy of the old forest. The beet hazelnut is a readily identifiable shrub of the forest. It grows from distinctive slender trunks that come together in tight groups and reproduce by cloning as much as by spreading seeds. It produces broad, heavily toothed leaves, just like this one here. There is a single medium deep vein down the middle, comes to a lanceolate point, heavily veined to either side, and pretty well-defined small teeth and larger teeth indentations. The bark of the beaked hazelnut is rough and whitish copper gray brown. The wood is pliant like the cherry tree and can easily be bent as a person is harvesting. Yet the most distinctive feature of the beaked hazelnut tree are the hazelnuts themselves. They may grow singularly in pairs or in groups of three or four. The husks are always fused together at the base like this, however they grow. And once again, they have a very fine hair on them. And before they're ripe, that hair is nothing to be worried about. It's more like a fine fuzz, but as they approach ripeness, that hair, I can feel it on the tip of my finger there, it doesn't sting, but it becomes, it becomes brittle and sharp. And as you harvest these, those hairs will become like hundreds, even thousands of very fine, tiny splinters in your fingers and it will become very painful if you continue to harvest. If a person is going out to harvest beet hazelnuts, it really cannot be done without leather gloves. You have to have a means to protect yourself from those hairs. After you've harvested the hazelnuts, simply take them home and spread them out to age someplace warm, dry, with low humidity. After a week or so, once they're dry, those hairs mostly drop off. They lose their ability to trouble you and then the husks become like dried paper and they can easily be peeled away from the ripe nuts inside. I just came upon this little curiosity here just as I was hiking back. This is the abode of some small animal, most likely a forest vole. I'm not really an expert in rodents. I know some people who can tell by the pattern at which they cast out this dirt, whether or not they're neat about it, what type of rodent it is. But you can see the dirt that was thrown out of his hole as the small animal dug its den. It was a very busy little animal. That was a lot of work. I wonder if this might be one of the small creatures in the forest that will compete with me just a wee bit for those hazelnuts. There'll be plenty for them. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Edible and Medicinal Treasures of the Wildwood. Go soft, go gently, go with courtesy, and leave no trace. Let's go home, boy.